Namaskar. Uh, a very uh, hearty welcome to each one of us here. And uh, it's uh, our pleasure to have such uh, illuminating galaxy around. But let me first of all uh, welcome Honorable External Affairs Minister, uh, Dr. Jay Shankar, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor, uh, Dr. Vidya Yaradkar, Vice Chancellor Ram Krishna Raman. Uh, along with, of course, I'll be introducing my illustrious panel a little later. But for me personally, uh, it's been great pleasure to have Dr. Jayashankar amongst us. He was our contemporary at School of International Studies, JNU, in the mid-70s when we were pursuing our PhD. We always felt proud of his achievement and more importantly, his continued uh, quest for academic excellence. Uh, we are also thankful to the organizer for inviting me, uh, a supposedly a peace researcher. <laughs> Indeed, in today's conflict-prone world, our strategic culture must include India's rich perspectives on peace building and conflict resolution. Uh, we have remarkably distinguished panelists here, and uh, each one of them is known through his uh, uh, recent writings, transformating writings, uh, Mr. Sanyal is the author of uh, revolutionary books like the revolution, revolutionaries as uh, the minister yesterday mentioned, along with the land of the seven rivers. Personally, I've been reading his, uh, you know, uh, transformative ideas and literature for a long time when we look at the Indian perspectives. So welcome you, sir. And uh, Professor Gautam uh, Disraju, he is a professor emeritus of Solid State and Structural Chemistry Unit, Indian Institute of Science. And his recent book, Bharat India 2.0, uh, is his uh, remarkable contrib contribution to offer an alternative perspectives on uh, the pathways India should move uh, uh, today in today's world. His second book on India's supply chains uh, is in changing world is in preparation. So welcome you, sir. And of course, uh, I should say the youngest, but more <laughs> remarkable, we've been discussing things since breakfast, uh, Dr. Hindol Sen Gupta. And uh, he has been very prolific in writing and his upcoming book, India as a Civilizational State, uh, we look, really look forward. And he just mentioned that the other book on political Hinduism or something it will be out, I think, very soon. So um, let me very quickly, I mean, time is short, 90 minutes. The way I divided it is 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes for me, 30 minutes for the honorable speaker, and 15 minutes each for the discussant. And 10 minutes I kept as a buffer, just in case you know, somebody wants to uh, go beyond that. So let me very quickly talk about Banaras Hindu University in Varanasi, where we have set up a center for peace research named after the found founder of our university, Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya. This was a center with a difference in the sense that uh, we uh, proposed to uh, essentially draw on Indian knowledge system, Bharati Gyandhara as we call it, uh, in order to provide alternative frameworks to resist the North Atlantic uh, traditions of knowledge which have inflicted almost all walks of uh, social sciences, all disciplines of social sciences, and we especially looked at uh, uh, the peace and conflict issues. And we have made progress. And UNESCO decided to establish a chair there on intercultural understanding and peace. And in our own way, uh, we are contributing. We look at peace not in terms of uh, uh, the, uh, only the uh, absence of conflict, as was generally thought to be. Of course, the West has also progressed there. But still, the shadow of uh, a liberal peace build building is very much there. And uh, we have tried to establish the contribution of Indian knowledge system, the, the, the Indian traditions. Uh, for example, we look at peace and conflict not in a, as a binary, but as a continuum. So I was just mentioning this morning that Mahabharat is also a book of war and also a book of peace. So, and also there is an enormous contribution that uh, is yet to be uncovered, yet to be brought before the international community, 
I mean, how the Indian uh, treaties and uh, uh, Vedas, Upanishad, and beyond that, till very modern time, how uh, uh, we have contributed to the to the core of peace building, for instance, uh, the uh, tradition of plurality, diversity, Shastrarth, dialogue. I mean, at times when I go to UN forums and I see people talking about dialogue as India has nothing to do with. India has the oldest tradition of Shastrarth. I mean, the very famous dictum, Vade Vade Jayate Tattva Bodha, I think is so popular in common parlance. And also Varanasi has been a seat of Shastrarth. And these Shastrarths have not been one or two between uh, Adi Shankaracharya and Mandan Mishra, but they have continued till recent times. So we have the tradition of uh, dialogue, intercultural understanding, and of course, not to miss the planetary peace, the Vasudev Kutumbakam idea that uh, is so dear to this institution symbiosis. And I think it was the first one who launched this idea and it's a mandatory course here. And every time I come here, I feel so uh, you know, gratified and happy that as, at least we are uh, telling our students about the concept of uh, planetary peace. Now, a little bit about the, very little bit about the, these, these two terms, nation and civilization. And uh, as a, a, you know, in earlier past, we used to know uh, these terms essentially through the theorems of uh, uh, Samuel Huntington and Fukuyama. And both of them emphasized a very different, and, uh, and this was an idea that virtually uh, was uh, dominated the intellectual scene when we came to learn about the nation and civilization. And Huntington, of course, everybody knows that he talked about clash of civilization, uh, overlooking complex societies like India, where people from conflicting civilization coexist, facing challenges to varying degree of success. UNESCO also proposed this uh, uh, decade of rapprochement of cultures, and we talk about dialogue of civilization. In End of History, Fukuyama argued that liberalism is ultimate stage of human development, almost discounting religion and nationalism. And that has been a problem with the, the kind of uh, approaches to peace that we have been dealing with or we have been coping with. For example, for long they had no patience for normative ideas and a term like religion was kept out of United Nations till year 2000. But now they are realizing the importance of uh, studying religion. But uh, in India, for instance, we have very instructive and interesting contributions uh, from Swami Vivekanand to Rabindranath Tagore. And uh, uh, they were writing at the cusp of 19th, 20th century when the idea of Indian nation and nationalism was fast catching Indian imagination. And uh, it's, I'm sure that the panelists will cover many of these ideas uh, in passing or otherwise. But Tagore's hierarchy of nation, civilization, and law of the world uh, especially appeals to me in which he creates a, a three hierarchical system in which civilization is at the highest level and nation is a part of that syndrome. And uh, similarly, Vivekanand and uh, Tagore, both of them talked about, looked at uh, the term bhav, which describes the concept of civilization. Uh, and this term bhav informs all the people in a given uh, area or uh, you know geographic terrain and it informs and embodies the diversity of people so you know these, these are contributions which are still to be uh, highlighted and revealed and conceptualized and i'm really delighted to have uh, such a uh, you know three presentations which uh, all three of them in a way uh, puts out an alternative vision of nation and civilization so with these words, I don't know if I have crossed 10 minutes, but I'm sure I have. But uh, I would uh, first invite our main speaker, uh, 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 Professor, uh, Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal. And uh, so welcome, sir. And uh, you're young, but uh, you have admirers among the very old generations also, please. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Honorable Minister Jaishankar, Professor Zupadhyay, and Desi Raju, my friend Hindol, faculty and students of Symbiosis, ladies and gentlemen. What I'm going to talk about today is about Bharat Varsha. Our civilizational imagination, our nationhood is linked to this word Bharat. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history, 
Recently, there has been some largely unnecessary controversy about the increased use of the word Bharat. So I'm going to show you how this word, what is its origins, how we have over some five, six thousand years used this word to define ourselves as a civilizational nation. So what is its history? Because I think that's important to understand. Now, before we, I get to that, it is very important also to understand that there has been for a very long time, and particularly during the colonial period, a deliberate attempt to deny our civilizational identity. Very famously, Winston Churchill made the statement, India is a geographical term. It is no more united a nation than the equator. Similarly, John Strachey, acting viceroy of India in 1872 said, the first and most essential thing to learn about India is that there is not and never was an India. Now I understand that if you are a colonial power occupying another country, you want to make the extra effort to try and even deny that the country that you are occupying happens to be a nation. So if there was no nation, there can be no occupation. The question, as you will see, that will arise is why 75 years or now 76 years after independence, we still have this colonial debate still going on. And I think that's because we are ourselves not telling the story of where our nationhood comes from. So here we go. The very first use of the word Bharata happens in the Rig Veda. Now you can debate when exactly the Rig Veda was written and as I, I, my own sense is that it is at least before 3000 BC and I will tell you why. <clears throat> so it's at least 5000, maybe 6000 years old. And in this uh, Samhita, the word Bharata, Trutsu, they are interchangeably used, um, is the name of a Vedic tribe. And this tribe lives along the banks of a river called the Saraswati. The river is also, by the way, referred to as Bharati because the tribe sits ne uh, lives next to it. In fact, those of you, you who do Saraswati Puja will even know that the end of the Saraswati Suktam, when you do the Anjali in the morning, is Bhagwati Bharati Devi Namaste. So that word Bharati is important. And 45 hymns of the Rig Veda contain the name Saraswati. 72 times it is invoked. And it is said to be the mother of ri rivers, Sindhu Mata. Limitless, unbroken, swift flowing. So there's no question that the Saraswati, not the Sindhu, not the Ganga, the Saraswati is the main and most important geographical feature of the Rig Veda and the Bharata tribe lives next to it. So where is the Bhar Saraswati? <clears throat> now many attempts have been made to try and locate it somewhere in Central Asia, in um, Afghanistan and all kinds of places. The fact that it does not even exist but is mythical. Now let me be clear. In the Rig Veda, it is very clear it is real. And the Rig Veda itself tells you exactly where it is. Just a second. Yeah. The Rig Veda in the Nadistuti Suktam says, states, all the rivers of North India in order, going east to west. So it goes, O Ganga, Yamuna, Saraswati, Shutudru, which is the Satlej, Parushni, Ravi, Ashkini, Chenab, and so on. And so, therefore, it's very clear that it's a river that is between the Yamuna and the Satlej. There is no scope for debate on the matter. And there is many other evidence also on this. But just this alone will tell you where the Saraswati is, between the Yamuna and the Shutudru. It also states very clearly that it's a river that goes from the mountain to the ocean. So it says, pure in her course from the mountain to the ocean, alone of the stream Saraswati had listened. I have in every single case given you the exact hymn and stanza so that you can go and look this up and uh, cro uh, um, cross verify it. Now the question is, where is this river? Because it clearly does not exist today. It turns out, if you look at satellite photographs, you can in fact even do this in Google Maps. It is that easy to do. You will be able to discern the dry riverbed of a river we now know as the Ghaggar, uh, in Pakistan known as the Hakra, and the green bits that you can see. Now this river existed for tens of thousands of years. It changed course many times, so there are actually, the, as you can see, there are many 
interlocking uh, courses. But basically, this river started out somewhere in the Shivalik. It flowed through what is now Haryana into northern Rajasthan, into Pakistan, back out, and flowing into the run of Kutch. It is very important that you understand that the run of Kutch looks like the way it does. It looks like salt flats, but in fact, it is the estuary of this dry river. That's why it is there. When it dried up, it left behind that those salt flats. But if you had gone there when the Rig Veda was being composed, it would have looked like the Sundarbans. And it is very obvious it was an important thing for ancient civilization. In fact, as you can see, the bulk clustering of Harappan sites are all along the dry riverbed of the Saraswati. Now, if it wasn't flowing, it wasn't important, you wouldn't have so many, uh, cluster, such a massive clustering of uh, uh, Harappan sites along this uh, river, what is now a dry riverbed. So it is very clear that this existed, and this much of the Harappan civilization was along it, um, and that this river dried up circa 2000 BC. So whatever it is, one thing is clear, that the Rig Veda had to be composed before 2000 BC, because otherwise, how would it know about this river? In, in fact, there is evidence that the river actually began to dry up even 3000 BC. So many of the Harappan sites were being built on the, on the, on the sides of a river that was already slowly dying out. And the description in the, in the Rig Veda suggests that this was a river that was in full flow. So this was in fact before 3000 BC. And that is why I keep saying the Rig Veda is at least, at least 5000 years old um, for this reason. Also important is that the drying up of this river is also mentioned very, very clearly in our texts. But before I get to that, let me tell you a little bit more. So we know now where the Saraswati was, and this was also very important, and that was very important to the Bharata tribe. Now, the Rig Veda also mentions a landscape called the Sapta Sindhu, the land of seven rivers. And this land of seven rivers is the name by which the Bharatas called their own homeland. But there is again confusion about what this homeland is, and very often casually people assume that this is the five rivers of Punjab, plus the, uh, the Sindhu, plus the Saraswati. It's quite obvious that the Saraswati is one of the seven rivers, but they tend to basically take Punjab because there are five rivers, plus one Sindhu, plus Saraswati. In fact, if you read the text, that is not the case. The Rig Veda is very clear that all the rivers of the Sapta Sindhu are actually tributaries of the Saraswati. So it says, again, I've given the hymn, it says, coming together gloriously, loudly roaring Saraswati, mother of floods, the seventh, with copious milk, with fair streams strongly flowing, fully swelled by the volume of their rivers. So it's very clear that the Sapta Sindhu is about all these rivers coming together. So the original homeland, as, and we, you can actually look at all the rivers that used to, the paleo channels of the Saraswati, it's very clear that the seven rivers are of a very small area that we today know as Haryana. So this is, so the Bharata tribe originally is a Haryanavi tribe. And we have more evidence of it. In the Mahabharat, by which time the Saraswati is already drying up, Balram doesn't participate in the Kurukshetra war. Instead, he goes on a pilgrimage along the drying riverbed of the Saraswati. And he goes from the south northwards. And then he mentions that there are these seven streams of the Saraswati. It said, call, he even names them. They are called the Suparva, the Kanchanakshi, Vishala, Manorama, Ughavati, Surenu, and the Vimalo Daka. Now, these rivers, most of them now today do not exist. They've also dried up. But again, we know that at least one of them, Oghavati, used to flow past Kurukshetra. Again mentioned in the Mahabharat. And it's very clear that the Oghavati is a tributary of the Saraswati. So I'm establishing that we are dealing with a very small area. Now, here comes how did the name Bharat go from being the name of a small Haryanavi tribe to that of the whole of India. Now I'm going to get into that story. Basically what happens 
And this is very, the only clearly defined political event that is mentioned in the Rig Vedas, or in fact, in all the Vedas, which is that the Bharata tribe, led by a chieftain called Sudasa, and his guru, the Rishi Vishishta, basically they are attacked by an alliance of ten tribes from the west. It's a confederacy of ten tribes, and this is mentioned <coughs> in... Uh, as the battle of ten kings. So what happens is that these alliances attacking them. So what happens is the Bharatas cross the Saraswati and they go westward and on the banks of the Ravi there is a massive battle in which the Bharatas completely decimate the ten tribes. In fact, it is mentioned that 6,066 warriors of the confederacy are killed. Many of them are drowned in the Ravi as they try to escape. Now, given the context of the population of that time, uh, you know, 6,066 people dying in, in, a, in a battle is a very large number. It must have been quite devastating. And then Sudas turns eastward and he defeats another tribe called, led by a chieftain called Bheda on the Yamuna. So effectively, the Bharatas come to conquer the first known empire of Indian history. And he then declares himself the Chakravartin and he conducts the Rajasuya uh, Yagya and, the, and declares himself the Chakravartin, i.e. the universal monarch whose chariot can go in any direction he wants. And the symbol of the Chakravartin is the wheel. That's interesting because the wheel is still there on our national flag. But then the Bharatas do something quite interesting and different. You see... Normally, you would expect that once you have defeated anybody, you then go to them and say, look, we have defeated you. You, Our gods must be stronger than your gods. So you have to worship our gods. Right? Normal thing to do. And still practiced in some ways in modern world. But the Bharatas did not do this. Instead, what they did is they called all the wise people, the rishis of all the defeated tribes, and they compiled all their ideas into the Vedic compilation, the Samhitas. So the Rig Veda, in fact all the other Vedas, are essentially a compilation not just of the ideas, hymns, gods, etc. of the Bharatas, but also of all the defeated tribes and in fact even of those tribes with whom the Bharatas had some link but hadn't actually defeated. So, for example, one of the defeated tribes is the Bhrigus, right? The Bhrigus are one of the most important contributors of material to the Vedic Samhitas. Similarly, Vishwamitra, he was one of the gurus who was in opposition to Vashishta. And yet his ideas are very prominently there in the Rig Veda. And therefore, what happens is that you set up this model, so the, the Vedic model is that not of imposition, but of assimilation. And this is also explicitly there in the Rig Veda. In the very last hymn of the Rig Veda, that's what the Rig Veda ends with, it has a chant. This is the last hymn of the Rig Veda, and where it basically says that all the ancient gods have a place around the fire. It's not just the god of the Bharatas, but all the ancient gods have a place around the fire. And here is the English translation. Assemble, speak together, let your minds be of all accord. As all the ancient gods take their rightful place around the fire, the place is common, common the assembly, common the mind, so be their thoughts united. A common purpose do I lay before you, and together we make offerings into the fire. United your resolve, may your minds come together, united the thoughts of all that we may all happily agree. Now, this is essentially the beginning of Indian civilization. This is the operating system where everybody has a place around the fire, but the condition is that everybody will respect everybody else's gods. So we accept your gods, but everybody has to accept everybody else's gods as well. And this then idea begins to spread. It's a powerful idea. And so thousands of years later, by the time the Puranas are being written in the Iron Age, you can see that the Sapta Sindhu has gone from being just the tributaries of a river that has now dried up and occupied, the idea has now occupied the entire subcontinent. 
So there is a very well known um, chant for ritual bathing. Many of you probably already chant it yourselves, which goes Gange cha Yamuni Chaivas Godavari Saraswati Narmade Sindhu Kaveri Jalasmin Sandhanim Kuru. Half this room probably knows it. So what has happened? This, these are seven rivers. The concept of seven rivers has gone from a the tributaries of the Saraswati. Saraswati is still remembered here, by the way. By this time, it's completely dried up. But you can see it now includes the rivers, not just of North India, but also of Southern India. And so now Sapta Sindhu is the name by which we know our civilization, but it has now spread. And in the Purana, same various Puranas, you also have, in fact, in every single Purana, you also have a description of what this landscape is. So, it then you have here, I have very often Vishnu Purana is used at the, as the example by others. I've deliberately used Bibek Debroy's um, translation of the Brahma Purana, but it's there in every Purana. It says that the Varsha, i.e. the land that is north of the ocean and south of the Himalayas is known as by the name Bharata and the people there are known as Bharati. So, it's very clear where this landscape is. We also know that the, peop the Kiratas, i.e. the tibeto burmans live to the east and the Yavanas, i.e. the Greeks, live to the west. This also dates, by the way, when this particular Purana was composed because by this point, clearly, the Greeks lived to our west, which is, must have been just after the uh, Alexandrian invasion, maybe when the Seleucids were ruling uh, Persia and so on. But you can clearly see there is, it's not just uh, our own landscape, we also know who are living east and west of us. It also mentions the landscape inside India. I talked about rivers, now I'm going to, it talks about other landscapes as well. Here is a description of all the, um, uh, uh, all the uh, mountain ranges of Bharata. So the seven mountain ranges are Mahindra, which is eastern ghats, Malaya, which is Southern Western Ghats, which we now is, know as Nilgiri, Sahya, West, Northern Western Ghats, the Sahyadris, where we are right now, so Suktimat, probably the Aravalis, the Riksha, which is the Satpuras, the Vindhya, which was originally about, uh, constituted the Eastern Vindhyas, and the Parya, uh, <coughs> Paryatra, the Western uh, Vindhyas. And then, those of you from the Northeast, in case you are feeling left out, it also states that those who reside in the east are the inhabitants of Kamarupa. So clearly there is a description and all of this is there in the Brahma Puran on a chapter on Jambu Dvipa, which is another name by which we know ourselves. Now, there is very often an attempt by the Dravidianist schools in Tamil Nadu to suggest that somehow this conception of India excludes the southern tip of India. That is totally not the case. So let me tell you a little bit about Tamil literature. The, Tamil, the oldest Tamil literature is the Sangam literature. It was compiled between the 2nd century BC and the 2nd century AD. And in that collection, the oldest text is a grammar, the Tholkapiyam. It is a grammatical treatise. It is compiled around about the 2nd century BC. There is no older Tamil text, okay? And in the preface of the Tolkapiyam, it says, in the virtuous Tamil-speaking land that extends from Venkatam in the north to Kumari in the south. Incidentally, you, it is roughly Tamil Nadu even today because Kumari is Kanyakumari and Venkatam is Tirumala Hills, that's Tirupati. Yeah, it's roughly speaking. Tirupati itself is in Andhra, but it's on the border. So you can see, and this is the first expression of Tamil identity. And in this, in the same preface, it says that this Tamil identity is based on in the wisdom of the four Vedas rooted. So let it be very clear. The first enunciation of Tamil identity is rooted in the four Vedas. And there is no way of getting around it because it is right there, clearly written out. Now, just so that you know that despite this expansion of the idea of what Bharat is, Haryana is not forgotten as the origin. Okay? 
So next time you meet a Haryanavi, please have some respect. The land of the seers, it is remembered as the land of the seers, i.e. the rishis. It is known the land between the Saraswati and one of its, uh, and of the Drishadvati, which was one of the uh, tributaries of the Saraswati. The land between it, which is roughly today's Haryana, is known as Brahmavarta, or land of the gods. So there is, there is a memory that there was something special, the place of origin of this idea of Bharat. Now, there are later stories also about how the name Bharat came to be used. Now, Sudasa was a descendant of another great warrior called Divodasa, and he is, of course, the leader of the ten tribes, uh, of the Bharatas when they defeated the ten tribes. But there are later, late, there is a later texts, much, much later, thousands of years later, mention a king Bharat, Bharat. So this king Bharat, not to be confused by the son of Shakuntala and Dushyant, this is another Bharat who was actually much earlier. And this king Bharat, who is the son of Rishab and the grandson of a great warrior called Nabi. Now Rishab, by the way, is also the founder of the Jain tradition. Uh, so, so same one. And this is there in both um, uh, uh, um, Hindu texts and in Jaya texts. And it says that the, there was a King, Bhara, uh, uh, king Nabi conquered all of Jambu Dvipa. So by the way, India has yet another name which I discovered as a part of this research. It is Nabi Varsha, land of Nabi. His son Rishab took over the throne, but then he gave it up to become a... Uh, 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 become a hermit and a, and a sage. And in the Jain tradition, at least he is a founder of the Jain tradition. And then his son, Bharat, again carries out uh, conquests and conducts the Ashwamedha Yagya. He's declared a Chakravartin. And after him, the entire landscape is known as Bharat Varsha. Now, I do not know for sure how exactly this King Bharat is linked to the much earlier king Sudasa. That is totally unclear from the texts. You can try and guess. There are obvious some parallels between the two. Uh, they, they are great warriors. They conduct the Ashwamedha Yagya. They are, they are um, they declared as Chakravartins and so on. Perhaps the later texts are a very distant memory of this great king um, uh, uh, Sudasa. I don't know. Uh, but since one of them is clearly older than the other, uh, hang on, how did I, yeah. Now, let me skip forward. Please don't interfere with the, with the things, yeah? Thank you. Now, while all of this is going on, we are also trading with the rest of the world. We are trading with the Western Persians. We are trading with the Middle East and many others, uh, also eastward to Southeast Asia. So... They are also aware of us. So what is the names by which they know us? So in the Avestan texts, this is the oldest texts of the Zoroastrian tradition, um, which is written in language, incidentally, very, very close to Rig Vedic Sanskrit. They have a, there's a text called the Vendidad, which actually is a sh short form of Videvodata, which means against the Devas. And it's very interesting because essentially, the Western Persians are trying to differentiate themselves from the Indians. They are probably the same people. There's some sort of a religious dis uh, dispute because their great god is Ahura Mazda, the Asura. And this is interesting because in the Vedic tradition, the Devas and Asuras are not given, they are in conflict with each other, but there is no connotation of good and bad. Many of the great gods are Asuras. Rudra is an Asura, Varuna is an Asura. But in later texts in India, the Devas are seen, seen as good and the Asuras as bad. And the exact mirror image is true of the Western Persians. And in their texts, they mention this, uh, in this text called Against the Veda Devas, they mention <coughs> that uh, 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 this land called Hapta Hindu. Now, this is important because in ancient Persian, it is basically almost identical to Rig Vedic Sanskrit, except sa sound becomes ha. By the way, this exact same thing happens in modern Assamese as well. So, my name Sanjeev becomes Hanjeev. 
Yeah, so the exact same thing happens <coughs> in the other side. And so Sapta Sindhu becomes Hapta Hindu. And the Saraswati is known as Harahwati. I'm doing it in the Sanskrit pronunciation, so I, because I don't know a Western. Uh, I'm doing it in the Assamese pronunciation, but it's very, very similar. Anyway, what is also interesting is that this text mentioned that these lands of Hapta Hindu and Harakhwati were good places to be. But unfortunately, Angara Mainyu, the leader of the Devas, has taken these places over. And that these places have become too hot and beautiful Harakhwati is now dried up. And, you know, these people are violating various funerary rites and so on. So, the point is, it meant, it, there, is a, there is a clear mention of these, these places of Sapta Sindhu, the name by which we know it, our country, in another place. It is the first place we mention it, but it is not interestingly mentioned only as the land Hindu, but in the context of Hapta Hindu. I want to make this because very often people use this as a, like, the name Hindu or Hindustan, etc. come from the Sindhu River. It doesn't. It comes from a short form of Hapta Hindu. At least that is the oldest reference. And it means the land of the seven rivers. The exact name by which, by the way, the Indians also call themselves, the Bharatas, also call themselves. There are other foreign descriptions of India. The Chinese, the Greeks, the Arabs, they of course use the word Hindu. The ancient Greeks, because the Hindu word then goes further westward to the, to the Mediterranean and becomes India, Indioi, Megasthenes, Indica. But when it goes eastward, the Sir is retained in other ways. So, for example, in, uh, uh, or changed in other ways. So, in the Chinese, it becomes Yandu, Chiangzu. Uh, in, in, in ancient Egyptian, it becomes Hindui, medieval Arabs, Al-Hind. And you have Al Biruni's book on India describing the civilizational unity of India. So it's not just Indians who think we are a civilization and a people. Other people also recognize that there is a civilizational nation. There may be political divisions, but we are. So and Al Biruni states this. He says, yes, they are divided into people, but they are clearly a civilization, a, a people. And in fact, by the way, since people like quoting Al Biruni, it is also worthwhile remembering that he was actually a spy sent by no less then Mahmud of Ghazni, to write a book about India. And he gives very clear estimates of distances as well in the book, including measuring distances from Kanoj and a, a sacred tree in Prayag and so on. But meanwhile, we have now moved into medieval India. And this conception of a sacred geography, a civilization and landscape is still there. It hasn't been forgotten. And in fact, the last hymn of, this, of the Rig Veda is still being used to define this, that around the sacred fire, all the gods have to be given their place. So, this point is reiterated repeatedly. For example, there is the story of Daksha. He does a great yagya, he calls all the gods, but he does not give a place to Shiva. So therefore, he has violated the Rig Veda com contract. Yeah? And so what happens? Sati turns up and she herself basically stops the, 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 the yagya and sacrifices herself to the fire and kills herself. And then Shiva turns up and he's so angry that he lifts his body and it, it, there is a fear that he will destroy the world. So Vishnu cuts up her, Sati's body and scatters it across the landscape. And it falls all over India. And you can see how it is. The northernmost is, is now unfortunately in POK, the, the, the temple of Sharada. The southernmost, Kanyakumari. The westernmost is Hinglaj Mata in Balochistan. The easternmost is in Tripura Sundari in Tripura. And of course, it's scattered all over. There is a, some concentration to the east because Shakti worship is particularly popular in the east. But you can see it's all over India. And effectively, what is happening is that Sati is uniting this sacred landscape in her own body. So this same idea is being reiterated that if you do not adhere to this contract of giving all the gods a place around the fire, then you are violating the central civilizational compact. And so in her own body, she is uniting this landscape. 
Same thing happens with Shankaracharya's uh, uh, yatras. He is, goes all over India. You can see these are not random travels. Nor are the places, mathas, where he establishes them. They are at four corners of the sacred landscape. Puri, Shringeri, Dwarka and Badrinath. Same thing happens when you have the Trichy declaration of Maradu Pandyan in 1801. So you're now into the modern era. And you can clearly still see this idea of a civilizational landscape is still there. By this point, of course, they are beginning to include also Muslims into this. So there is a declaration after the uprising of the polygars against the East India Company and their chief Maradu Pandyan makes a declaration in 1801. And read what it says. It says to the castes and people, the Brahmins, the Kshatriyas, the Vaishyas, the Sudras and the Muslims that are in Jambu Dvipa subcontinent of Jambu Dvipa, this notice is given. So this is a declaration of independence, which is clear that all the people of Jambu Dvipa, he's not saying all the people of Tamil Nadu. I'm sorry if you're a Dravidianist, but please read your own, what your own ancestors were saying. And you can see that also with Vivekananda's trips around India in 1890 to 91. This is not a random landscape that he is traveling around. It's, he clearly starts from the eastern end and goes all over India, all the way down to Kanyakumari, where he very famously goes to the rock to, uh, in the sea to meditate. So the idea of Bharat is ancient but and evolving. Uh, it is not a pure civilizational idea because it has grown through assimilating new ideas. So uh, it is not a pure idea, but it's certainly an old one. At various points in time, it included parts of India that is not in the geographical uh, borders of modern India, perhaps. But the fact that this, I, by, while modern India's borders, the Republic of India's borders are indeed modern, the idea of a civilizational nation is not. And that is why it is very clearly st stated when the founders of the Republic of India were very conscious of this, when they were making the constitution, when the the, when, the, when they were when the uh, when the speech at, at at the moment of independence was made by Pandit Nehru, he reiterates this. Here again, Jawaharlal Nehru, 15th August 1947, says, "When the soul of a nation long suppressed finds utterance, well, in order to be long suppressed, it needed to exist. No, it wasn't just a union of states." And in fact, the very first line of the Constitution of India says, India, that is Bharat, shall be a union of states. So this is very, very important to know. Now it turns out that Dr. Ambedkar was aware that some future generation will begin to misinterpret this construct of union of states and try to show it as, oh, you know, we are just a random assembly of states. So. On the first, 4th of November, 1948, he made, took the trouble of stating exactly what he meant. And here is the clarification he made on the draft constitution in a speech to the Constituent Assembly. He says, though the country and the people may be divided into different states for convenience of administration, so it's only for convenience of administration, the country is one integral whole. Its people a single people living under a single imperium derived from a single source. What is that source? It's the source of a civilizational nation, Bharat Varsha. The drafting committee thought it is better to make it clear at the onset than to leave it to the speculation or dispute. In other words, he had anticipated a certain 53-year-old. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Fascinating, isn't it? Thank you so much, Mr. Sanyal, for traversing thousands of years in just sharp 30 minutes time. And probably I was just thinking about Tagore's writing, which I tried to read before <laughs> chairing this session. He, his presentation captures that bhav that Tagore talks about of Mahabharat Varsh. And uh, it's so beautifully done. And I'm sure that this should be circulated, disseminated everywhere to make us more confident about what we do and say. Now, my, uh, we are doing very well with the time. So, of course, the, uh, our uh, discussant, Professor Gautam 
this Raju is here, and I'm sure that he will be. Uh, we had a little discussion about the time factor, and I said that never in my life has I asked anybody to stop. So please go ahead. But 15 minutes is what you have. Thank you, sir. 15 minutes plus or minus estimated scan. I already deviation. said 10 minutes buffer time. You know, that's what I initially offered. Honorable Minister for External Affairs, Dr. Jai Shankar. Chairman of the panel, Professor Upadhyay, my co-panelists, Mr. Sanyal, Mr. Sengupta, dear friends. Now, yesterday, I think, in Minister's last sentence, he said something about we posing the questions and the future generations giving the answers. Now, this is, uh, I think good academics like to Actually, if we can pose good, good questions, that's enough. Because a good academic knows that he or she, the answer is probably, if not incorrect, at least incomplete. So answers develop slowly. It's important to ask questions correctly. And listening to all the speeches yesterday, I get the feeling that, <clears throat> see, we are all of one mind, like the last uh, Thing that you said, the last verse of the Rig Veda. Many people are of one mind, but we are still to find some cohesion somewhere. And the relationship between people in government, the minister, the probationers, the other people working in government, and then the academics and other people whom you have invited here. Namely, the... Um, please, the phone is ringing somewhere. Uh, what was I saying? The people from the think tanks, academics, whomever you have called. See, there is a, obviously, Mr. Minister and the others, you feel there is a need to call some of us here. Because if you had all the answers, you wouldn't be calling us. And you would be going on quite merrily and, uh, actually, your job is to do the methodology. Any kind of constructive activity requires a strategy and a methodology. And your job is, correctly to carry out the methodology using all the things that, the tricks that you all have learnt in your profession. Now, what about strategy? We have heard this word strategic autonomy. And I think you also said yesterday something about the fact that foreign policy of any country depends to a large extent or to some extent at least on what is happening in the country itself, the policy within the country. And never could a truer word be said because uh, if a Finally, we, in our system of government, the politicians come for, stand for election. And if they don't understand the mood of the people, they're going to lose the election. So any responsible politician knows what the mood is. And unless the people in government know what the people are thinking, they will not get that large, last extra X factor in conveying our foreign policy to other countries. Now, why are we even having this discussion? Because for the first time, we are not an abjectly poor country. I am not going to call ourselves a rich country or anything. We are not abjectly poor. So, at, at least we are able to think in terms of how to project ourselves. Minister said that they may or may not appreciate all the things that we stand for, whereas they appreciate what China stands for. Yes, it will take some time probably, but then how do we go about it? From the academic viewpoint, it's a very difficult question. Do we follow the methods used by those people and try to get ourselves into a position of power in say 25 or 50 years? Or do we use our own indic things which have been described adequately yesterday and even today some of the things that you have said. Now, fact of the matter is why are we even talking about the old things? It is because we are still a living civilization. It is not a dead civilization like Egypt or Assyria or something like that. We are a living civilization. So the question is, is there something from that old stuff that we can pull out and use, let us say, in an adversarial or in a neutral way with a foreign country because above all, they don't understand our way of thinking. And that should be an advantage. Because if the enemy or whatever we want to call him if he doesn't fully understand what you are up to, then it's better for you. So in the light of this, I want to just stick to a small point in this brief presentation, country, nation, civilization. 
some of these words have been used by Mr. Sanyal, and uh, and I've given a matrix representation of these things. Uh, India as an idea. You see, we've got in science hypothesis, theory, and law. Hypothesis simply an idea. Anybody can have an idea. Nehru had an idea of India. Savarkar had. Ambedkar had. Now, Mantri and Madhusudan have written a book called New Idea of India. There, tomorrow there will be a newer idea of India. So many ideas. So then what happens? Now I think, when does a hypothesis become a theory? Theory is more grounded in reality. And when there is enough good data to back up a hypothesis, then slowly, slowly it becomes a theory. Now the problem with Nehru and his idea of India was that they sought to make a hypothesis into a theory using incomplete or even inaccurate data. For example, these funny words added to the preamble, so many other amendments. Today is Constitution Day, by the way, I just remember, 26th November. So we're all talking about this thing. Now, so these are all kind, trying to force fit an idea to make it a theory by using incomplete or inaccurate data. Now when you try to do that, it's like giving a guy a pair of shoes that's too tight. And then you tell him, I'm giving it to you free, now start running with these shoes. He can't, wow, he cannot move also with those shoes. So then, then, then what happens, the next step will happen is Karl Popper's theory of falsification. When you have a hypothesis is based on wrong facts, it gets, theory gets falsified and out it goes. So what happened? The 2014 election. So that was the falsification of this hypothesis which was sought to be made into a theory. So after 2014, there were some elements of reality crept into the situation. Okay, now then what happened next? Uh, people thought, okay, this is a spurious data, some spike, some delta function. Wait until 2019, then we will go back to the what we wanted. No, it didn't happen. It happened even in further in the same direction it went. So now we are sure that we are more grounded in reality today than we were in 2014 or even 2019. What 2024 brings, of course, we all want to know. Anyway, that is not a topic for today's thing. Now, <laughs> country and all, I don't want to waste too much time. Enough has been said. Countries go on having different names, different borders. Some Rhodesia and Nyasa land was there. Then it became Zambia, you know, Malawi, Zimbabwe. So many things. Names change. Some names are even, there's a controversy on the name. Do we call it Formosa or Republic of China or Taiwan or Chinese Taipei? Nobody knows. So each person will call it his own thing. Of course, in India, there's no problem. Bharat and India are both legitimate, regular names. Both are in the constitution. I'm not going to get into that. Now, nation. We, in the same city, Atal Bihari Vajpayee said in 95, that according to him, Hindu nation and Indian nation were congruent. Now, uh, yeah, I have some problems with what Mr. Vajpayee said, because both terms, Hindu nation and Indian nation, somehow I don't know if they are fully accurate, and I don't mind the words Hindu or Indian, that word nation is bugging me here. Look what Ambedkar said about nationality. I think this is one of the finest definitions of nationality. Firstly, he says it's subjective. Then he says it produces an anti-fellowship feeling for those who are not of one's own kit. This us and them business, this binary. What is not us is them. And then he says, severs them from those who are not of their kind. These are all very drastic sentiments. And this Ambedkar's definition is a post-Westphalian idea. It more accurately corresponds to the European nation states, which got some kind of a form after the Vienna Congress of 1815 and more definitely after World War I. So it is more pertaining to those kinds of things. And if you heard much of the discussions yesterday, somebody said that we are instinctively, we are told not to hate your enemy. Okay. This is all about hating one's enemy. Okay. So this nation word, it is okay. I think it is okay as a temporary phase. Better than old ideas of India. But still... We need to graduate. I think Mr. Sanyal just said that civilization, or I think it was chairman who said, 
that it is a different layers and the civilization is a higher idea than a nation. So then I want to spend the rest of the time uh, talking a little bit about civilization. Now civilization means different things to different people. But this is an extremely modern definition of civilization. It is not an old definition. And in the Constituent Assembly itself, the famous midnight session, he says, this is very nice, this is very modern. It is the imaginative interpretation of the human life and the perception of the mystery of human existence. This is all about thinking. It is about mind. It is not about matter. It is not about geography, rivers, and this and that, and so many place names and all that. This is at the deepest thing. If nationhood and all is a kind of manifestation of people looking outwards, civilization is a manifestation of people looking inwards. And the beauty of our civilization, of Bharat Varsha, is that all the people think some of these things independently and yet we are all there together like that Rig Veda last verse. That is why it has been going on for 5,000 years because it is something, something that was scheme that was fixed which took into account very many factors about the geography, history, climate, everything about this particular piece of land which we call Bharat Varsha. And it fits in so perfectly and that is why it has lasted so long. So Radha Krishna, he talks about things, it's got nothing to do with religion. And that is why, Mr. Minister and others, I feel that if we are going to influence other people, even this narrative word which you said yesterday many times, and other people have used, if we are going to be able to use this thing correctly, then we have to try to find ways of making people change their ways of thinking. And this is where you need academics, because I don't think bureaucrats are very good at making people change their way of thinking. Academics are, <laughs> because we deal with people at a very young age. <laughs> so we, de we deal with very young people at a time when their brains are still malleable, ductile, malleable, ductile, everything. So at that point of time, a teacher has great power because it's power for either good or bad. You can influence them in bad ways also. And they do. And uh, so if you can influence their mind, then, see this, Mr. Minister, this is not soft power. This is very hard power. Because once you get into their brains, then it's very difficult for them to come out of your, you know, grasp. So this is what he said. Now we, talk, we hear a lot about geography and all sacred geography, blah, blah, blah. Yes, I'll say that we lost uh, Gandhara in the very distant past. We lost Vijayanagara in the distant past. We lost, uh, let us say, Mulasthana and Lavapura 76 years ago. We lost these things. They may come back. But one thing about people's thoughts and civilization being related to thinking is that we can also create new spaces. We can create new civilizational spaces through thinking. And I'm going to give you a very familiar example, almost a trivial one. And it concerns an area with many of you have might have lived in also Ramakrishna Puram in Delhi. Now Delhi was a small place of less than half a million people in 1900. And you look at this small area in R.K. Puram, you find there is a bit of Tanjore district in the Uttara Swami Malay temple. You find a bit of Bengal in Kalibadi. The mummy is looking at her second son and seeing that he doesn't get into trouble. And uh, then there's a bit of Parashurama Kshetram in the Ayapa temple. And when you go to these temples, I've visited them myself, I'm sure many of you have gone there. Who are the people who go to the temple? At least 30-40% are North Indians who are going to all these temples, which have been set up by people from distant parts of this wonderful land. But nobody who goes to any of these temples feels unfamiliar. You know which gate to enter. 
you know that you have to circumambulate in a clockwise fashion and not anti-clockwise. When the pujari gives you some tirtam, you know that you have to put out your right hand. Some of us will even do this and hold it like this. So none of these things are unfamiliar to us. And it doesn't matter where you are. It is this feeling that I want to leave a positive feeling with this audience. We might have lost places, but we are also gaining places. Because this is all done through the mind. It is not done through material things. And that, I believe, is the strength of this civilization. Now, this is from the small. You know, Tyagaraja, he describes Lord Ramchandra. He says, he is in the ant and he is in Brahma also. He says, Chimalo, Brahmalo. So then from the small you can go to the very big. And this roughly in my mind is sort of our thinking space, our civilizational space. Where people think a little bit like us, maybe a little bit more, a little bit less. But basically people in this part of the world, which also by the way, I believe, I may be wrong, some of our key economic interests are there. We are writing this book on supply chains. India's supply chains in a changing world. This manuscript is ready. It's stuck up somewhere in a very high-up government office in Delhi right now. But we, yeah, we, we hint here that it is this area where our supply chains think, whether it is for lanthanides, whether it is for semiconductors, whether it's for fertilizers, whether it is for pharma, even whether it is for artificial intelligence. And there are supply chains for extraterrestrial research today. I think these are the places where we should jump and these are the areas where we should concentrate. Necessarily, if we go and start telling them, you know, Vidura said this, Bhishma said that, they may not be so interested. I'll be frank with you. But if we start telling them there is money in it, bucks for you, <laughs> then they'll listen. Mr. Minister, if I may venture to say... The whole thing is related to economics only in the end. The fact that we are even having this meeting and all and we are discussing is because, we are, as I said, we are not abjectly poor anymore. People look at a fellow if they have a little more money. So these fellows will look at us also. I mean, this is what I feel. I am an academic strictly sitting in and tomorrow I'll go back to, you know, atoms and molecules and crystals. But any, any thinking person will probably come up with the kinds of things I've been telling you. And uh, yes, so this is towards the end. And this is part of this book, which I hope will see the light of day before long. Really, I think from a civilization, we are going to an empire. And let us avoid this nation and nation state and all which we are not. We are not a nation state, period. And if we become a bit richer, if we do all our things correctly, if all our IFS probationers become very smart people in 10, 15, 20 years from now, and they fully understand the ethos of this country and what the people really want, then they will be able to, we may be able to move from civilization to empire. In fact, if you look at the whole world today, post-World War II, say, you know something I really reminded today, we are almost at the same thing we were at the eve of World War I. Suddenly, four empires collapsed in four years' time. And then after World War II, you got into a bipolar and then monopolar. In science, we know monopoles are very unstable. They don't, they don't exist. So again, it comes back. Then China came up. And then gradually, with things waning and things waxing, we may end up with four empires, America, China, Russia, India, in say 25 years. And Basically, what is the difference between an empire and a nation state? Empire seeks a sphere of influence outside its immediate political domain. That big red map that I showed you all over the place. And then this word mandala we have heard many times. I think all big states use this mandala concept. America also uses. It's not that it is something that is unique to us and blah, blah. So I think if we were to... Civilizational substrate is important because it is that civilization that gives us real power, it's hard power, physical and or institutional power. Physical power we are getting, institutional power I fear we still need to get, at least I can speak from the scientific side, from our academic structure, our academies, all that not good. 
we need a lot of things to be done in that scientific side and let me also say i'm not making a pitch for my own subject or things like that no country became a superpower without doing very good stuff in science and technology no country no amount of economics it will only take you up to a certain point unless you are able to do your own very good science your own very good science which leads to very good technology it has to be your very own this whole western thing this drama they have been playing out for 500 years started with a guy called copernicus who suddenly came and he started showing things in a different way we need a different way a different way of doing even this so snt is going to be so that is the institutional power capability and capacity this swami vivekananda has used these words so capability can we do it capacity do we want to do it i think these are also questions that have to be asked and they become come into the political and methodological domains they don't come in the academic discourse that is up to the people who are going to take decisions to do and i think that then this is really all that i wanted to say and i shall end i think my last slide see you don't need that fancy picture that i showed in the first slide of that brihadeshwara temple to tell you what our civilization is all about this picture will tell you now this picture can be anywhere it can be anywhere in that red big red map that i showed and it's not just the small idols you see here it is even that tree it is that mountain that rock you can almost feel the hot air you can feel the breeze you can feel the hawa which is very different from any other place and it could be anywhere it could be nowhere i took this photo myself 3 4 weeks ago and unless you actually been to this particular place none of you will be able to know where it is but all of you have seen a place like this so i think i rest my case at this point this is our civilization and i believe that yes thank you and i believe see if 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 our foreign service probationers and all understand that this is what we are all about then i think you will get that extra x factor which will be able to make you look at the americans or the chinese or the russians or anybody straight in the eye and i think minister said yesterday somebody else also said this is true about families it is true about states it's true about countries if we know who we are and we feel good about who we are only then and only then will the rest of the world take us seriously so thank you very much thank you i'm virtually speechless thank you so much uh in our uh, academic world we often say that it takes a, an outsider somebody outside your disciplines to raise questions which we don't anticipate and uh, professor has raised questions and he has really uh, cast his net wide transdisciplinary and it had to happen from a professor of solid state physics uh, chemistry <laughs> see my <laughs> somehow a professor of physics <laughs> always told me that the only real good science is physics you don't agree <laughs> <laughs> but i think all of us enjoyed and uh, you know a, a session should have all different uh, aspects knowledge history and at the end bhav as uh, swami vivekanand uh, and uh, tagore would say to bring us together on the same template i request uh, dr sen gupta to uh, well i have stopped looking at the watch it's your job not to look at it <laughs> honorable minister academics the chair professor v c raju and of course my good friend sanjeev and of course all the students and others in the auditorium thank you very much for this opportunity um before i begin my presentation i'll take a minute to explain because there are a lot of young people here to explain how all of this really started for me i had the fortune or misfortune of being at one of england's best known colleges when pulwama happened and i saw around me that uh, how a entire chorus um began to talk about india in a particular way and india's strategic choices in a particular way many people know here what those voices were what the criticisms were what 
appalled me particularly was that even Indian students studying the discipline of IR history who should know at least somewhat what India's predicaments are, were and are, seem to be entirely swayed by a different conversation, a different argument. It is a byproduct of that experience that I wrote a paper on what I call the Shishupal doctrine, taking, of course, from the Mahabharata, arguing that India's, Indian's way of applying course of diplomacy takes, in a sense, from our eternal ideas. Many of you would know the Shishupal story. The Shishupal story, of course, is about Lord Krishna forgiving that many times and not one more. And I argued that in our relationship with Pakistan, that moment had appeared when Prime Minister Modi decided to act resolutely after the Pulwama attack. The Shishupal moment was upon us. This was the beginning, in a sense, of my journey. And it continued in some senses. I must mention the Battle of Kolachal, about which Sanjeev Sanyal, about a decade ago, told me about. And I later in my work realized that uh, the Honorable Minister spoke about the Thucydides trap uh, yesterday. It doesn't apply to us because our context is different and no Indian student has ever taught that in the Battle of Kolachal, uh, Asian principality, so to speak, defeated a major European naval power. This idea is never embedded in our conversation. It is never taught to us. We are, as we have discussed many years over the last decade, especially, we are taught history and we are taught about our civilization and about our strategic choices as almost a conversation of negotiating defeats and not accessing and understanding victory. I want to begin from that point and I'll end in a different note. But today I want to talk to you a little bit about the Indian Ocean. History is important to understand here, and my first slide talks about two people, Rajendra Chola I and Zhang He, because my presentation is about how India and China, using historical argument, place claim on the Indian Ocean. This is, of course, Rajendra I depicted as Lord Chandrakeshwara at the Gaikonda Cholapuram the heart of Chola power, and of course, the Qing Dynasty Inc. illustration of Zhang He. Why are this, these people important, ladies and gentlemen? You will be astonished to know that many, many people in India don't recognize, you know, we talk about so many dynasties and important dynasties that ruled India, but perhaps especially in the North and Central, perhaps even in the Eastern India, Few people realize how long the Chola dynasty's power and rule really were. The Cholas were one of the longest and most influential ruling dynasties, certainly of their time and perhaps in history. They were, of course, a maritime power. This map gives us a sense of where that maritime power really stretched from where to where. And across Southeast Asia and other parts of Asia, you can see that the Cholas were planting the flag of their power and their culture, their influence, their ways of worship, their ways of life across this region. As my third point on this slide shows, uh, this of course shows not only trade routes, it shows Chola territory, its influence, and the naval conquests of the Cholas both in India and Southeast Asia. The Cholas are important in modern politics too. We have heard more about them in recent past. Uh, as I was saying, they were a maritime power devoted to spreading their influence through military and cultural expeditions uh, from modern day Malaysia to Cambodia, Indonesia, Vietnam. Across the board, the Cholas planted their flag. The earliest diplomatic interaction between India and China, uh, in fact, was most probably when a retinue from the court of the Chola King Raja Raja I around 
1015, went to the court of the Song Emperor. And it was during this time of the Cholas that adventurous merchants from their kingdom set up guilds in Indonesia and Myanmar. This history, of course, in more contemporary times has been, uh, you know, in a sense, resurrected in contemporary conversation, both by uh, the Bharati Janata Party and its ideological parent, the Rashtriya Swam Sevak Sangh. Uh, before I, let me try and go back for a moment, sorry. Nope. There's one other point worth mentioning here. The year that Prime Minister Narendra Modi became Prime Minister, that year the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh, and these are the links from history to contemporary politics, celebrated the thousand year anniversary of the coronation of Raja Raja Wan. Just talking about the Prime Minister, one of the quotes of the Prime Minister, the Indian Ocean has always been the cornerstone of the worldview of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who has emphasized on many occasions that India has had a long time uh, maritime tradition, the seas forged links of commerce, culture, religion, and growth, specifically highlighting the contribution of the Cholas. The Indian Ocean is India's ocean. Why is it India's ocean? It is India's ocean because India lays claim to this ocean using this history. All of this is, of course, in the backdrop against which India has always considered the Indian Ocean as its own. It's our backyard and firmly under our influence, we believe, we take the Indo in the Indo-Pacific very seriously. Now, not, of course, without contest. Our biggest um, Asian rival, our biggest rival, China, also has its own claim, ladies and gentlemen, on the Indian Ocean. And they have their own history that competes and contests against ours. China's history teaches it about a man called Zhang He. Uh, recently, Zhou Bu, a retired senior colonel from China associated with Tsinghua University Center for International Security and Strategy, gave a lecture at King's College London. He said, it's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time before a Chinese carrier strike group appears in the Indian Ocean and that India should get accustomed to China's presence in South Asia. <coughs> He added, my apologies, he added, I do not think it's necessary to remind everyone here that during the Ming Dynasty, Zheng He's fleet, the most powerful fleet in the world, went to the Indian Ocean seven times. Therefore, China is not a newcomer to the Indian Ocean. To safeguard China's growing interest in the Indian Ocean and maintain the security of strategic sea lanes, the Chinese Navy must maintain or even strengthen its presence in the Indian Ocean. You can see how history is being used to underline contemporary strategic choices, not just to underline, but actually to explain contemporary strategic choices. It's only a matter, he added, of time before a Chinese carrier strike group appears in the Indian Ocean. Since the end of 2008, the Chinese Navy has been sending naval formations to patrol the Gulf of Eden, and the Somali Basin in the Indian Ocean. Who's Zheng He? Zheng He is very important. This map shows the voyages of Zheng He, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth. In total, he had seven big voyages across the um, Indian Ocean. This shows some of the routes through which Zheng He traveled. Um, here, you know, he's one of the most famous maritime voyagers and generals in Chinese history, uh, commanded some of the biggest ships of his time in the early 15th century, seven great voyages uh, from Southeast Asia to West Africa, bringing back treasures for the Chinese emperors. Those are his roots. History is geopolitics, geopolitics is history. The two are intertwined, the two are embedded, it's tough to pass out the two 
The Chinese President Xi Jinping has invoked the legacy of Zheng He to promote his Belt and Road project in 2017. Quote, um, in the early 15th century, Zheng He, the famous Chinese navigator in the Ming Dynasty, made seven voyages to the Western Seas, a feat that is still remembered today. The Chinese ambassador to Maldives, uh, another Indian Ocean country that India considers its natural area of influence, Wang Xing, recently told the state television of Maldives, the friendly exchanges between China and Maldives have enjoyed a long history. About 600 years ago, Zheng He, a Chinese navigator, visited Maldives twice, which showed the ancient maritime Silk Road had already connected the Chinese people and the Maldivian people long time ago. You can see that in the contest between India and China on the Indian Ocean, in the Indian Ocean, history collides, not just contemporary strategic choices, not just contemporary politics, but history collides and bumps and scrapes against one another. History is weaponized, history is used, history is used to make arguments, history is used to make, uh, you know, define strategic choices, explain why countries behave in particular ways, why they claim certain territory as theirs. Therefore, history is particularly important. Civilizational states, ladies and gentlemen, in my humble opinion, have to be ever vigilant about history. Because in pitching these legacies, each country emphasizes the long history, the cultural depth, and how each country could be a bedrock for future collaboration with other countries in the region. This, of course, means that these histories form the basis of the two Asian giants butting heads in the Indian Ocean. History is a critical tool, especially for the geopolitics of civilizational states, which indeed distinguish themselves on the basis, as both my earlier speakers on this panel explained, they define and explain their existence using their long history. And that's why it's particularly important for civilizational state. Lack of historical awareness could lead to ineffective geostrategic arguments. History, therefore, we have to be always be vigilant about this. Before I conclude, I want to leave you with one image, ladies and gentlemen, which, is, uh, which was not originally part of my presentation, but when I heard my friend Sanjeev speak, I thought it was particularly relevant to mention this. There is a professor of Chinese studies called Tao Jing who recently talked about two things. He said, if, the, if Western civilization, so to speak, derives its sense of self from Plato's allegory of the cave, then where do the Chinese derive their sense of self? It's a question he asked. And he answered that question by saying, the Chinese derive their sense of self from what he referred to as the fable of the frog in the well. Right? All of us are familiar with the fable of the frog in the well. And that led me to ask a question about which I wrote an essay, of which I want to give you a sense. I asked myself, therefore, if Western civilization draws its, you know, its reason for existence, as it were, from the, uh, from the allegory of the cave, and the Chinese think that it's the frog in the well fable that defines you know, them and what they want in the future, what about India? What about our long history? What about our civilization? Where should we draw our defining fable from? And uh, during that time, I was writing, uh, you know, uh, a history of a part of Vaishnavism and a, a big preacher of Vaishnavism. And I was reading a lot of Vaishnavite history. And it occurred to me that one of the most interesting in that Vaishnav universe, one of the most interesting parables, fables, comes from the Puranas and... Also, it's found in many other texts. It's an image many of you might be familiar with of Gajendra Moksha. What is Gajendra Moksha? Gajendra Moksha is this wonderful thing. And you, you, many of you would have seen this image. It's basically Gajendra the elephant, the animal India is most associated with, is in a, it goes to the, a pool, a pool of water, where it's sort of you know, having a good time. A crocodile comes and catches the leg of Gajendra. And it seems for some time that the elephant would die, right? Because it's a, it's a stranglehold. The elephant is being dragged into the waters by the crocodile because its hold is so strong. The elephant then has two choices. Can it fight back? Yes, it could fight back. 
but fighting back only on its own maybe doesn't have the courage or the confidence to fight back. It then remembers that there is a higher sense of self. Of course, in the parable, it looks to Vishnu. A higher sense of self from where it derives confidence. You know, in the parable, they say when Gajendra remembers the Lord, Vishnu leaves everything else and comes in Garuda and saves the elephant. That's the conclusion of the parable. So I argue that this higher sense of self, this revertal to a higher sense of self, this recognition that there is a deeper civilization from where India can derive its confidence is particularly important for us because that's where our moksha will come from. And this is particularly important. You know, Swami Vivekananda made the same argument. People in Bengal and other places think of Swami Vivekananda only as a spiritual teacher. But remember, Swami Vivekananda, is, in a sense, was making the same argument. He was the confidence of the colonized. He represented the confidence of the colonized. He was making the argument all those years ago in America, at the Parliament of Religions and other places, that India, even though caught by the by the jaw trap of colonialism at that time, had a higher sense of self, that high, and if it could turn to that higher sense of self, its moksha, its success, and its confidence would come from there. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I argued that perhaps if the allegory of the cave defines the West, frog in the well defines China, perhaps Gajendra Moksha defines India, and I think the moment has come when India is rediscovering its sense of self, and hopefully it's smoke shares nearby. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, thought provoking and fascinating and not to miss the Gajendra Moksha idea. We have been using this expression in our <laughs> language, little realizing the implication for it. Five minutes back, I was told there are time for three questions, uh, but now, that was five minutes ago. So uh, let's start with questioning. Two would be enough, but third can, we'll see. Crisp questions, quick questions, please. Thank you. You have Thank to you. raise your hands. Yes, we already so, have one. Good morning, everyone. Myself, Neerada, and I'm from SSIS. So my question is, can India's propagation of a civilizational consciousness for itself be understood in terms of the idea of hyper-nationalism? So first of all, the question is, what is our nationalism and what has been the basis of it? So as I pointed out to you that this civilizational nationhood that we have would not be confused with other countries, Westphalian nationhood and any other kind of nationhood. Ours is a very old idea of self. It has served us very well for multiple, in multiple ways in terms of integrating our identity and so on. But notice that throughout this very, very long history, we have not gone and invaded other people and unnecessarily imposed our view because the very basis of this civilization is assimilation. It is not imposition. So after all, the original Rig Veda, when it was written, the important gods in there are Indra, Varuna, and so on. Most of us don't come from Haryana. At some point in the very distant past, my own ancestors, who perhaps were from Bengal, would probably, I don't know, maybe they added Durga and Kali and others to the pantheon. And a space was created for them around the sacrificial fire. So in this way, there, this expansion of ideas happened. It is very different from the way other countries, other forms of civilization, other forms of uh, nationhood have tried to impose their ideas on others. Ours is not such an idea. And so therefore, the fear of hyper-nationalism, very often derived from European history, should not be equated to us. It's their problem. Let them solve it. Why should we have to somehow uh, beg for forgiveness for their sins? I just want to add one small point. You know, this entire idea that civilizational states are something to be afraid of, uh, that is propagated by, um, you know, some Western scholars, including, you know, Chris Coker at LSE, who's written about, written this very interesting book on civilizational state, where he argues that essentially all civilizational states will essentially look like China and Turkey, and therefore they will be illiberal. That's not true. Um, you know, many of us are arguing and have argued in the past that 
it's not true that all civilizational states must necessarily be liberal. That's a fundamental mistake, and it's a mistake made you, you, because a framework is being used in a particular way. There is no reason to force fit that framework on India and argue that the Indian civilizational state must be illiberal, not at all. In fact, I would argue that by its very nature, the Indian civilizational state will be uh, and is and will be liberal. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we completely negate our sense of self and take away every you know, sense of our uniqueness uh, because no one else is doing this. So therefore that expectation on us is fundamentally flawed. Uh, we have, must argue that India as a civilizational state will not be like China or Turkey for that matter. India as a civilizational, uh, from its very basis, is a liberal concept. Good morning, sir. Thank you uh, for such an enlightening discussion. Uh, so you, uh, sir, my question is to uh, Sanjeev Sanyal, sir. So you talked about the civilizational unity. And so do you think there's a need to change the narrative of unity in diversity to diversity in unity? Well, um, you're right that there is, well, I wouldn't change the narrative. I would say that, look, that relationships works in both ways. You're absolutely right. And while there is university, uh, you, there is unity and diversity, there's also diversity and unity. And that is precisely the point. There is a place for all the gods around the sacrificial fire. That is the starting point of our civilizational idea. But it requires that both things, one, that there is space for all the gods around the fire. Two, it also requires that all the followers of each of these gods respect all the other gods as well. You may have your favorite god, but you have a certain respect for all the others. And in fact, there are these, this repetition of this, uh, uh, of this idea repeatedly through many of our cultural festivals, ideas. I gave the example of the story of Sati. What is going on here? Essentially, Shiva is denied his place around the sacrificial fire. Consequently, that entire yajna is invalid and Sati in her own body then unites that country back. There is another legend, Holi, the whole festival of Holi. What is, the fest what is it about? It's about the fire the, that Prahalad's father denied wor worshipping Vishnu. He was a worshipper of Shiva, Shiva and he did not want his son to worship Vishnu. And here again, the whole cycle goes through and then finally what happens is that Vishnu in the form of Narasimha comes and kills um, Prahalad's father. And Prahalad, who by the way is an Asura, <laughs> is then worshipped as part of the Holika cycle of Holi. So why are we doing this? So basically the same idea that you have to make space for everybody else's gods is embedded in the very conception of Indian civilization. But it is based, however, on this idea that you have to allow, it's not just about giving everybody a little bit of space and tolerating everybody. You, it, is a, it is a system of cross respect. Everybody has to respect everybody's uh, other people's gods. So this is a very fundamental idea of plurality. It is a different idea, by the way, of the Western idea of secularism, incidentally. Our idea is really of pluralism. So let me begin. I mean, it hardly says, it, this was never an easy theme to have a session around. But the three wonderful panelists we had, we have, they made it look so conceptually rich and raising questions and probably uh, we hope that this debate and discussion uh, will go on. It's very important for us to understand the core of, as I say, bhav of uh, what nation is, what civilization is. So thank you very much. And the wonderful audience paid attention to uh, our journey across time and space, thousands of years, and still talking relevant things for the contemporary world. Thank you very much once again. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Sanya, Professor Desi Raju, and Mr. Sen Gupta for such an enlightening discussion. And a special thanks to Professor Upadhyay for taking us through the ideas of nationhood and civilization. I would request the Pro-Chancellor of Symbiosis National University, Dr. Vidya Ma'am, to please felicitate the panelists.